Hey guys, my name is Shashan Kalanithi. I'm a data analyst, and today we're going to be going over chapter four of hands-on machine learning with scikit-learn, Keras, and TensorFlow. This is my, a part of my ongoing series going over every single chapter in this book as I learn it and then passing on my learnings onto you guys. So I'm actually a data analyst, and I mostly work with um, like cleaning data, munging data, and transferring data and creating dashboards for people, but I would really like to get into the data science space and work in uh, machine learning and um, AI a little bit more and be able to apply that kind of stuff to my daily workflow. So in a quest to learn all this stuff, I'm reading what I've heard being been called the Bible of data science. So let's get started. So chapter four will be a little bit different from other chapters in that it doesn't really have um, in my opinion, the code is not particularly important because I've run a couple of machine learning algorithms before and like the code that we're using here isn't like what we would use to actually run those algorithms in real life. So I'm actually going to go over the conceptual parts of the chapter because for me, it's what took a while to understand because it just it's, it's kind of like out there. All right. So how do we train models? Okay, so. Uh, chapter four is about training models, and they specifically apply a lot of our trainings to linear models. Um, and I, we, we first want to go over how you actually like train the model. So when you're, whenever you're training a model, what the algorithm is really doing is every iteration, it's trying to train the parameters, not the hyperparameters, mind you, but these things called parameters, so that the model best fits to our training data. Remember, we have our training data and our testing data, and we want to make sure that the um, Oh, so we have our training data and our testing data, and we want to make sure that our uh, model is trained on the training, da training data and is very predictive on the training data. That way, it hopefully works really well on the testing data. In order to actually do the training, we pick something called a cost function, and then we try and minimize that function. So the cost function is what we're trying to minimize in order to get to the fitted model, um, basically the model that is our predictor. Um, so examples of cost functions uh, include root mean squared error and mean squared error. If you remember in our previous chapters, we've gone over those before. So the cost function um, basically tells us how well that the algorithm fits to the data. Uh, and, and a lot of this chapter is going to be focused on like the theory behind how we actually like fit a cost function. There is a lot of math in this chapter. Um, I would, I, going through it, I would like to come back to it and, uh, and understand the math a little bit better. Um, but in order to make sure that we make some continual progress, uh, I'm going to skip over it right now and then come back to it uh, probably in a later video. Um, I think the math, I, I, the way I like to learn a lot of the times is I like to like learn like the basics uh, and then apply, apply, apply. And then in application, I kind of intuitively understand the theory a little bit better behind what I'm doing. So that's kind of what I'm doing with the math over here because it, uh, is, it, it's got, it, it is a little bit above my head. So the basic steps for training a machine learning algorithm include preparing the training data. So the, this is all the stuff that we did in like, especially chapter two, like, you know, train, train test splits, scaling variables, uh, encoding categorical variables, imputing missing instances and feature engineering. This is basically everything we need to do to get the data set ready to have a machine learning algorithm applied to it. The next thing, the next thing we do is we choose a machine learning algorithm. So uh, something, something like linear regression, uh, support vector machines, something like that. And then we choose a cost function. And this is the function that determines how accurately um, our algorithm fits to our training data. And finally, we optimize for our cost function. And this is what we're going to spend a lot of time in this chapter focusing on, which is, uh, in this case, optimize basically means minimize the value of the cost function. So you'll be able to plot a cost function on an x, y axis or, you know, an, uh, an, an, uh, a multidimensional um, array in some way. And it might look something kind of like this. Um, the example they give in the book is actually a uh, parabola. But here's an example of another type of cost function you might be able to you might run into. And what you're really trying to get to is you're trying to get to this point over here, the point, the what is called the global minima. This over here is what you can call a local minima. And a local minimum is basically a minimum point that is just minimum for like a region of the graph. What we, re what we really want is a global minimum. Um, and an example of a cost function, like we mentioned earlier, is a mean squared error, which is, you know, essentially the mean of the residual. So, for example, if you have a plot, the distance between um, your prediction line and every point in your training data set is uh, a residual. And then you basically square those residuals and then add them together. And that's your mean squared error. Um, and that is a cost function that we, we might want to um, minimize. So how do you actually calculate the minimum value of a cost function? Um, we can use something called an optimization algorithm. Um, I don't know if that, that's not the term he used in the book, but like when I was like reading it, it 
looks like it's basically an optimization algorithm. Um, the most perfect solution will be borne out by the normal equation. Uh, and the normal equation is just the equation that directly gives us the result of the minimum of our cost function. Um, and this is the actual equation for it. Basically, you're trying to find the pseudo inverse uh, matrix of the cost function matrix. Um, and it's called the pseudo inverse because uh, my understanding is that um, only square matrices have true inverses, uh, but you can find inverses or like a pseudo inverse of a, um, a rectangular matrix. Uh, again, don't worry too much about this. The point is um, the normal equation will give you the perfect uh, point of the minimum of your equation. Um, now, the problem with the normal equation, the reason we don't use it all the time is because of something called computational complexity. Basically, that directly solving for the normal equation can quickly become very, very computationally complex. Uh, and if you want to solve for the normal equation, you'll end up with um, this is big O notation basically tells you how complex computer programs can uh, or like uh, algorithms like get as you add more data to them. Um, and basically what this is telling us over here is that computational time is multiplied by two to the 2.4th power, which is, you know, about eight, uh, which is, sorry, 5.3. Uh, so 5.3 to eight times um, if we use like the normal equation. Long story short being that if you have a lot more data or a lot more features, it's going to be significantly harder to solve for the normal equation, so much so that it may not be possible. And this is a note I want to really touch on. Um, I was actually working on a project for uh, like like at my full time job, and um, we had to make I had to make a lot of decisions um, as to like how much information I could actually give and how good of a solution I could actually give to the stakeholder. Um, given that they wanted such a quick turnaround, like I could have given them a perfect solution if given a week, but I don't, I only had a couple of days to get the data and just the sheer amount of data I had to pull and I had to like munge through meant that my queries would take about 30 minutes to run a piece. So I had to really think things ahead of time and like, uh, be very careful every time I ran a query, because if I needed anything changed, which the stakeholder always comes back and asks for something changed, um, it would take me a while to run those queries again. And the point I'm trying to make over here is that um, oftentimes a perfect solution is not is, is not like something you can do in analytics. You have to get something that's pretty close um, because the amount of data that you'll be working with is such that um, every like running the calculation takes, you know, uh, hour like like many minutes, if not hours, if not days, um, and sometimes even weeks um, for particularly complicated problems. Uh, and, and that's why they bring in the data analysts. You know, if it was stuff that could be all done in Excel, um, then uh, people might just be doing it themselves. All right. So this is the uh, th this is basically the code you can use to like um, uh, mimic the uh, normal equation. Again, it doesn't really matter uh, unless you want to learn the math behind it. In which case, um, I think you would be better qualified to handle it than me teaching you. Um, and the book does a pretty good job explaining it. So what happens if we don't have the ability to find the normal equation, as in it's too complicated or you have too much data? Then we do something called gradient descent, where basically gradient descent, long story short, you know, all of this explanation over here, long story short, what you're doing is that the um, computer will like will, will um, kind of go, will, it'll like a score a point one like in a certain direction, up or down the slope, and basically keep going as it goes down to try and find the minimum point. And what happens is once the computer gets over here and it goes to the right again, oh, this point is slightly higher. Well, okay, I guess this is the minimum. Let's just stick here. Now, you can have a problem with the um, uh, gradient descent where you find a local minimum on accident instead of a global minimum, or you plateau out where you're not seeing any significant gains. And you're like, okay, this must like not be a big deal. Um, so these are actual problems that can be encountered when you're using gradient descent. Um, and the, the point at which you start on the cost equation is called your, uh, it, well, is, is picked through something called random initialization. And that's basically where you fill theta in, which is like you just, you know, where you are on the cost equation um, with a random value just to, you know, start off somewhere. Uh, and the learning rate is basically the size of the steps you're taking in order to get to the minimum. Um, and a, if you, as you can see over here, a large learning rate, like, so let's say you started over here. Uh, can lead you to actually go higher and higher instead of minimizing um, uh, as you should. Oh, and I should also mention that gradient descent like understands it's going down based on the slope of the graph at any given point in time. All right, uh, and then these are just like different methods for like handling gradient descent. Batch gradient descent basically like calculates gradient descent using the entire data set at each step. Um, so like 
over here, it'll like calculate um, the cost function at, for the entire data set here, and then here, and then here, and then here. Um, and it's very, very slow, but it is. it also scales well with the no amount of training data you have, but not the number of features you have. Remember, features are just columns. Stochastic gradient descent uh, picks a random instance, basically a row, from your data set and then calculates the, the gradient on that instance by switching the instance each time you reach um, a uh, minima. And then basically what this is doing is that this is uh, helping to make sure you don't end up at a um, uh, at too much of a local minima. You'll end up at a good minima, but maybe not the optimal one. But it is much, much faster and works great with massive training sets. Uh, and the mini batch gradient descent is basically the same thing as gradient descent, but gradient descent but works on like random batches of instances um, and uses that to calculate gradients. Learning curves, um, the so a learning curve is um, so when you use cross validation in order to split your training or in, like in, you know remember we used cross validation in the previous chapter to like split our training set into multiple uh, sections. The learning uh, learning curve plots the value of the cost function versus the training uh, number of instances for both the training set and the validation set. So basically, it's showing you how, um, as you bring in more training samples, your um, algorithm is actually learning. And this is your cross-validation score and your training score. And this this can lead to two different things. So you can, uh, when you're training your data set, right, you can get either bias or variance. And bias is basically a generalization error that's due to uh, the wrong assumption. Assumption. So, for example, this is an example of bias. This is the um, what do you call it? The uh, algorithm is biased lower. Um, it, I didn't illustrate it too well, but basically, it's biasing lower than it should be, and therefore, it's underfitting our data. When you underfit your data, your algorithm is not that great at actually predicting the. Uh, it does not have tremendous predictive power. On your test data set versus variance as you can see you know this data is very varied um, this is a generalization error that leads to excessive sensitivity um, and sm uh, to small variations in the training data and leads to overfitting um, and so you'll see over here the data is completely overfit uh, and then there's irreducible error which is basically just error due to um, it, it's nothing you can really like account for in the actual training of your data um, and the only way to get rid of this is to clean your data um, and then what happens is when you have bias and variance, typically, as you increase bias, you um, reduce variance and vice versa. So you want to get to a point where your bias and variance are at acceptable levels. So we can use something called regularization in order to deal with models that overfit. So for example, say you have a model like this, right? What we can do is we can regularize it, which is basically just a method of adding some, um, I don't want to say random noise, but adding... Um, a little bit of like generalization to the model in order to make sure it doesn't fit so uh, it doesn't overfit so much. And in regularization, we have a couple of types of it. So we have Ridge, Tikhonov, or L2 regression. So these are all the exact same thing. Um, and then we have Lasso or L1 regression. Um, and John Starmer of StackQuest actually provides a tremendous explanation of this that I believe is better than the one provided in the book. Um, I think in this chapter, a, a lot like I had to like consult a lot of external resources because the book was very, very math heavy um, and nothing wrong with it, but it didn't really do a great job of like intuitively explaining, it, which is kind of like, at least the point I'm trying to get to right now, I'm trying to intuitively understand this stuff and then I'll get back and understand the math later. Um, so ridge regression is used to, uh, whoops, let me get myself back in here. There we go. So ridge regression is used to introduce bias to the data in order to generalize the data and increase bias. Um, and this is useful if you don't have too much training data. So basically what it does is you have your, like, you know, y equals mx plus b. That's your linear equation over there. And then you introduce this, um, uh, what do you call this, lambda x squared part over here. And what exactly is this? Um, the lambda is exactly, that is what we're actually manipulating. Uh, and in general, ridge regression, uh, the ridge regression penalty um, are all parameters, like x squared are all parameters except the y-intercept. What that means is that they're, uh, if you have like a linear regression with multiple um, uh, x's, so like x plus x squared plus x to the cube plus, plus x to the fourth, you will have an x uh, for each one of those um, values. Um, and what happened, one interesting thing about ridge regression is that it can create like a linear model even when there aren't as many points as necessary to create a linear regression. Um, so like and John Starmer goes over it really well in his video. Um, and I, I would basically be copying what he said if I was to, you know, explain how I understand it.
Lasso and L1 regression. Uh, and then this is, uh, so Lasso stands for least absolute shrinkage and selection operation uh, operator regression. Um, and Lasso regression works the same way as ridge regression, except it follows this equation over here. So instead of X squared, it's uh, the absolute value of X. And if the variables you're using to provide Y are very useful, then ridge regression will uh, tend to perform better than Lasso regression. But Lasso regression will like reduce the weights of each individual variable because you're not squaring them anymore, right? You're just getting the absolute value of them. And so if your algorithm is not particularly predictive, um, then you might want to use something like Lasso regression. And then elastic net basically just combines the two of them. Another concept that he goes over in this chapter is the idea of early stopping, which is a simple way to regularize iterative learning algorithms like gradient descent by basically like as your um, uh, cost function is not reducing that much, you can just stop and say like, hey, this is good enough. So you can always set your algorithm and we'll be implementing this in, I think, the next chapter, actually, because uh, SVM, next chapter with SVMs and SVMs can take a while to train. Um, you can actually tell your algorithm to stop at a certain point. That way it's not... Um, uh, trying to find the global minimum, which might take way too long to actually find. Another concept he goes over in this chapter is the concept of logistic regression, which is a technique used to classify um, uh, points. It's used to classify instances, which is really funny because it's called like it's called regression, but it's really a classifier algorithm. And what it does is it creates a graph kind of like this and anything on this side of the graph, basically like if, if we take this to be the center, 0 0.5, anything on this side, is in one class. Anything on the other side is another class. And then we have something called multi-class or logistic regression. Um, and that is regular, and, and regular logistic regression works when we want to classify our instances to one of two classes. Um, and we want to classify them to one of two, more than one of two categories. So we have something called softmax or multinomial regression. So softmax is basically a generalization of the logistic regression formula. Um, and it can be used to handle multiple classes. So what happens is when you actually like implement this, you will uh, be typing in like softmax um, into your um, into the logistic regressor in order to make sure that it actually knows that it's a multi-class uh, regression. Um, and, and we'll actually be implementing one of these in a future chapter um, where we don't actually implement it right now. It's just to be should be mentioned. Another concept that they go over is the concept of the cross entropy. Um, Oh, I should, I, okay, I should probably go over this. So whenever you like, whenever you do a multi-class um, regression, right, you will get a output kind of like this, where it gives a probability of each class existing. So if you want to predict something can be in class one, two, or three, well, there's a 66% cha uh, chance that this instance is in class one, a 24% chance that it's in class two, and a 10% chance that it's in class three. Um, and I believe you can actually like implement, yeah, you can actually like put this code into your IDE and it'll actually run this and get you a result similar to this. The point I'm making over here is that um, when you are running a classification algorithm, it'll give you a output kind of like this. And the probability, it's gonna be the one with the highest probability is a class that you're most, that the algorithm thinks that, um, that the algorithm basically predicts that um, the instance is a part of. Uh, cross entropy and log loss. Um, so cross entropy equations is the cost function that we want to minimize for um, a multi-class classifier. Um, and the output will be something like this. And then this is basically how it's actually calculated. So you take the negative log of each instance and then um, add them together. And that's your cross entropy. And then when you train an algorithm for a classification problem, you'll create decision boundaries that kind of look like this. So like, as you remember how I said earlier, this green one is the logistic regression. Anything to the left is um, not Iris Virginica. Anything to the right is Iris Virginica. And I have a couple of further readings over here. Um, so th that is basically what chapter four is. So chapter four went over linear equations, uh, li I'm sorry, linear regressions and logistic regressions and how to like actually train them. Um, to me, the really important part over here was the gradient descent stuff, the um, and, and then regularization and learning how to how do you actually train an algorithm. Remember, we take the uh, cost function, we try to minimize it. We can use the normal equation, which will give us the uh, cost function directly, or we can try the um, uh, gradient descent, which will give it to us uh, less directly, but it will use significantly less computational power to do so. 
So those are the two ways we can minimize our cost function. Uh, or um, and, and and for example, in categorical data, our cost function is something like cross entropy. We'll be going going over. I think we actually went over the cross the cost function for categorical data in the previous chapter when we went over categorical. Um, when we went over categorization problems, I have a couple of further readings over here of just some really great resources that people have. Um, I usually put this in here one to cite, you know, where I got some of my information from, and then also if I feel like I can't explain something better than someone else um, already did. Um, if you like the work that I'm doing over here and you want to help support what I'm doing over here, please feel free to, uh, well, one, like and subscribe. Really make sure you like this video and please subscribe. Subscriber accounts are useful for me in order to know that, oh, hey, like I'm actually like growing as a channel and likes are great for the YouTube algorithm to know that, hey, Shashank's videos are like worth actually like um, showing to other people so we can spread the knowledge to as many people as possible. Uh, my Patreon is a tremendous way to support me directly. I uh, would really like to... Uh, make this like a thing that I do regularly uh, and make this like a very like viable enterprise for myself um, and in order for me to like you know dedicate time to doing this uh, the patreon is a great way to support that work and tell me that you uh, like what we do over here as usual these notes will be available on the patreon as a little incentive for anyone that is uh, on the patreon but thank you guys so much for uh, going over chapter four with me and we'll be back soon with chapter five